the search for sustainable development becomes the search for an, an adequate mode of civilization uh, in the 21st century. At the center of the idea of sustainability, I think, is an ethical imperative to pass on an undiminished uh, future uh, to our children. Well, no one is smart enough or can know enough to predict the future. So uh, if prediction is not a possibility, then how can we make progress uh, in thinking about our options and thinking about the future in an organized manner? And this is where scenario analysis comes in. When we discuss scenarios, we talk about three broad channels radiating out into the future. One we call conventional worlds, basically a, an evolutionary sequence of events despite hiccups like the current meltdown, that the basic paradigm and values persist into the future. The second channel is barbarization, which uh, markets and policies are unable to cope with the uh, crises, uh, and the chaos, and the social disruption, and the environmental uh, deterioration that is induced by conventional worlds. And you have uh, futures of catastrophic disruption. And the third we call great transitions, uh, where people rise to the possibilities, to the promise of this planetary phase with new values and new institutions and steer and development steers towards a, a more fortunate uh, form of civilization. Two necessary conditions that must evolve to reach a civilization worth living in. Over the next 10 years, we will see uh, a wave of engagement and action of the citizens of the world. Um, I think the, what I call for shorthand a global citizens movement is the necessary condition, the necessary change agent for uh, a sh turning uh, away from catastrophe, away from the abyss toward Earthland, this great transition future. I think that the upsurge in civil society that we are seeing now and have seen for the last 20 years is a glimpse of what could occur. But that civil society ferment uh, is limited today by fragmentation, by lack of a shared vision of the possible. And I think this global citizens movement is ready to be born. I think it's latent. I think it could be brought to life. So that was the first area. I think the second area is, is this. Away from consumerism and individualism and the domination of nature and more towards questions of uh, the quality of life and the uh, uh, ecological sensibility and human solidarity, uh, that would also be the second pillar that would signal that a sh shift towards a great transition is possible. I think if uh, we get to a, this livable future, it will be because humanity has found a way to balance the imperatives of global responsibility with diversity and pluralism in modes of culture and development. When we take our trips to outer space and we look back, we see an integral blue planet. We don't see imaginary lines of states. And so that this globalism, uh, this sense of the Earth as a natural uh, unit for a human uh, organization and identity uh, is some ways more profound than is, are the imaginary boundaries of, of nation state. When we look at the question of value change that could undergird uh, this great transition, uh, I think we have to look at 
the process of change in, in two arenas, one in affluent countries and one in developing countries. In affluent countries, we're already seeing the precursors, the questioning of uh, the meaning of the good life, turning towards uh, questions about the quality of, of, of existence, not just the quantity of things as defining success uh, and well-being. So that's one area is of value change is in terms of what it is to be a whole person and a fulfilled person. I think when we come to the question of the developing world, there's an even more profound transition uh, that we can imagine. To begin to define their own agenda for development, that there are plural paths to modernity, not a single path and that their own paths can leapfrog a lot of the mistakes uh, that have gone on in the industrialized world and begin to come up with forms and models of development that build on local traditions and customs and culture. Another area comes to uh, the question of the environment. People, I think, are coming to see that the rapaciousness of the past must give way to a sense of humanity's place in the web of life and dependence on its health, sustainability, and bounty. So this is a major, almost Copernican shift in awareness. Copernicus taught us that we didn't live at the center of the universe, but that we were on a planet uh, that revolved around the sun well, this new Copernican revolution, I think, is telling us that we are not at the center of Earth. We are part of the web of life, of this grand ecology. And if we don't take care to see our place within it, then we may go down with it. I think there are three major areas that we need to move down uh, to begin this transition. And those areas, I think, are understanding, vision, and action. I think we need to gain a better grasp of this world we live in and this emergent global system both as scientists and as citizens. We need to struggle to expand our mental maps, to traverse over space to take into account a global panorama, to span over time to think over many decades, where people from all over the world can find their place within this broad umbrella that unifies their various concerns uh, into uh, a broad-based uh, process of awareness building and political change that can actually begin to steer things in a fundamentally different direction. So when we do reach our time of troubles, which well could come, a time of systemic global crisis, that there is the political space and possibility for recovery, more than recovery, for building and beginning a new history.